Now we're the look at all the very latest this Saturday afternoon. It's the ITV News. A policeman at the centre of one of the gravest policing mistakes in British history speaks out. Officer C-12 is the man who shot dead Jean-Charles de Menezes after he was mistaken for a suicide bomber. At that stage in my head, this person knew who we were. This person, by the way they got up, was coming forward in order to detonate a bomb and kill us. Also tonight, the Queen will not attend this weekend's remembrance event because of a chest infection. Iran says it had nothing to do with a plot to kill America's president-elect and... Again. Remembering the wartime work of those whose job it was to entertain the troops. TV News with Geraint Vincent. Good evening. One of the Metropolitan Police officers who shot dead an innocent man after he was mistaken for a terrorist has said he opened fire because he thought he was saving lives. The firearms officer, known only as C-12, has spoken publicly for the first time in a documentary that begins tomorrow on Channel 4. Jean-Charles de Menezes was a 27-year-old electrician from Brazil who was shot several times after he was wrongly identified by the security services as a suicide bomber about to detonate a device. Amy Lewis reports. It was a fortnight after the 7-7 London bombings, a day after a failed terror attack, and officers in Stockwell believed they had a suspect cornered on the underground. They shot Jean-Charles de Menezes seven times. The 27-year-old Brazilian electrician was an innocent man. One of the police marksmen who fired, who has remained anonymous for nearly 20 years, has spoken publicly for the first time, but still only wants to be known as C-12. At that stage in my head, this person knew who we were. This person, by the way they got up, was coming forward in order to detonate a bomb and kill us. The following year, the Crown Prosecution Service decided that no police officers should be prosecuted. Oh, it's hard. It's hard telling you these things. Yeah, reliving it in this detail is painful, absolutely, of course it is. I want to make sure that people understand that these decisions, although they're taken quickly, are not taken lightly. And I've, I've never fired shots at anyone. I've never had to use that level of force at anyone before. He is one of two officers who shot De Menezes. They were granted anonymity, but until now, that hasn't been a guarantee for officers who fire and kill. Sergeant Martin Blake, who shot unarmed Chris Caber in 2022, was named publicly before his murder trial. After he was cleared, the government said firearm officers facing prosecution will be entitled to anonymity, up to the point of conviction. Dal Babu was a firearms commander at the Met. In all the hundreds of firearms operations I was involved in, none of my officers ever fired a shot, although two, two of the officers did get shot. So officers are very, very restrained in how they use firearms. But that means that they're very, very anxious and, and really need to get it right. The Met has told us our thoughts remain with Jean-Charles de Menezes' family and we reiterate our apology to them. The recommendations made by the Independent Police Complaints Commission were implemented immediately. An innocent life was taken that day in a split second. Amy Lewis, ITV News. Buckingham Palace has announced that the Queen will not be attending any of this weekend's remembrance events as she continues to recover from a chest infection. David Wood is at the Cenotaph. David, what else did the Palace have to say? Yeah, right. The palace has said that doctors have advised the Queen that it's best for her to stay at home and rest in order to fully recover from what they call a seasonal chest infection. This won't have been an easy decision for the Queen, though, because attending the uh, Remembrance Service here at the Senate's Half on Remembrance Sunday is one of the key events in the royal family's calendar. 
We understand, though, there is no cause for concern and that there has been no worsening in her condition. Of course, the service involves a lot of standing around in the cold, which is hardly the best medicine for anyone who has a chest infection. This illness has meant she's already had to pull out of two events this week, but there seems to be confidence within the palace that she will be back on royal duties within the next week. This weekend, she will mark remembrance in private at home as she continues to recover. But I think there will have been another reason why she is staying away tomorrow, and that is to protect other people as well and not pass on her illness to anyone else. This, of course, is a year where the health of the royal family has been a major headline. The king is expected to be here tomorrow. He, of course, is still being treated for cancer. Also, Kate, the Princess of Wales, is expected to be here tomorrow. She will also be at the Festival of Remembrance tonight. Two back-to-back -back events. We haven't seen much of her this year, of course, while she has been recovering. She was last on public duty a month or so ago. But I think the palace and the royal family will have been very keen to get this announcement about Queen Camilla out today because they won't want the focus tomorrow to be on them or the family's health. Instead, they'll want that focus to be on veterans and those who lost their lives fighting for this country. David, many thanks. The first recipients of a new award for those who have given their lives in public service have been announced. More than two dozen people were honoured with the Elizabeth emblem, named after the late Queen. They include two murdered police officers whose fathers have been campaigning for their sacrifice to be recognised. Louisa Britton reports. Police officers near the bone and Nicola Hughes thought they were responding to a burglary in Greater Manchester when they were murdered. Now more than a decade on from their deaths, they're among those being honoured with the Elizabeth emblem. There were two young girls, unarmed police officers, just doing a job, um, answering a, what they thought was a call for assistance from somebody. They were going to help somebody. There's, there's only one reason why I'm receiving this emblem, so that, that's a double-edged sword about that. But still, it, it's something to be, to, be, to be proud of. Nicola's father, Bryn, is among the family members to have fought for years for more recognition for their loved ones who died in the line of duty. They've all gone to work serving the public and as a result of that, as a result of defending the public, serving the public, protecting the public, they've lost their lives and nothing existed. So it's important that they get not only them, their memory and their legacies, but the families, the families have some sort of tangible memorial to, to be proud of. The first recipients of the honour include more than 30 firefighters and police officers. Fleur Lombard is one of them. A 21-year-old firefighter who died while responding to a fire at a supermarket in Bristol in 1996. That formal recognition of the state for the hard work that our emergency workers do and the difficult situation that they're in, the fact that they once was danger and sadly sometimes lose their lives, you know, that formal recognition will be some kind of comfort, comfort for our families and friends who were left behind. And for those family and friends, ensuring their loved ones' memories and sacrifice won't be forgotten. Louisa Britton, ITV News. Iran has denied plotting to assassinate America's president-elect Donald Trump. It follows revelations from the FBI that a known Iranian spy had been instructed to surveil and kill Mr. Trump by Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Meanwhile, the White House has confirmed that Mr. Trump will meet with President Biden in Washington on Wednesday, as one senior Democrat has blamed the president for the party's election defeat. Vincent McAvinney has more. Take a look at what happened. Oh. During his campaign, Donald Trump survived not one but two assassination attempts. Now we know there were plans for a third. Last night, the U.S. Department of Justice released these photos and unsealed an indictment charging an Afghan national, 51-year-old Farhad Shakari, with providing a plan to surveil and kill the president-elect on behalf of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. The Iranian government has described the claims as completely baseless, but Shakari is believed to have avoided arrest by fleeing to the country. Analysts believe the attempt will likely shape Trump's future approach to Iran. Meanwhile, Nancy Pelosi, the powerful Democratic congresswoman, credited with having ousted President Biden, has criticized him for seeking a second term. The anticipation was that, that if, there, if the president were to step aside, that there would be an open primary. And as I say, Kamala may have, I think she would have done well in that and been stronger going forward, but we don't know that. That didn't happen. 
We live with what happened. Democrats are now in deep reflection over what went wrong for Vice President Harris, with members of her staff also reportedly blaming Joe Biden for hobbling her with such a short time to mount a campaign. To add to the woes of Democrats, it looks likely Republicans will win full control of both houses of Congress, making it much easier for Donald Trump to push through a radical agenda. But for now, the president-elect is keeping an unusually low profile this weekend at his Florida club. In St. McAvinney, ITV News. At least 26 people have been killed in a suspected suicide bombing at a train station in Pakistan. Passengers were waiting on the platform in the southwestern city of Quetta when the explosion occurred. The Baluchistan Liberation Army, a prescribed terrorist group, has claimed responsibility. Qatar is said to be suspending its mediation efforts between Hamas and Israel. But sources say negotiations could resume if both sides show serious political willingness to reach a deal to end the war in Gaza. And here, 17 people needed hospital treatment after two double-decker buses collided in Manchester. Witnesses say passengers had to climb out of the wreckage, but no one suffered serious injuries. Now, tomorrow's Remembrance Sunday march past the Cenotaph in London will, for the first time, feature the relatives of those who have entertained the troops. Dame Vera Lynn was the original force's sweetheart, of course, but many more performers have kept up morale very close to the front line. And tomorrow their contribution will be formally recognised. Alex Isaac reports. Again. Since the start of the Second World War, the Entertainment's National Service Association has organised thousands of shows for troops at home and abroad. Stars included Vera Lynn, George Cornby, Peter Sellers, Frankie Howard and Gracie Fields. But it wasn't just star names. Many entertainers were civilians, like Doreen Thompson, who travelled to Burma with her accordion. She, she knew she, that she was raising the morale. Because my mum was portable with an accordion, on the ship, on the troop ships, she'd go down into the to the, um, the messes and just have a good old sing-song with them, and I thought it was great. She was with a lot of other just normal people who'd been catapulted into this, this theatre of war, helping the, the troops just to have a little bit of home. And now, for the first time, entertainers will be officially honoured at the Remembrance Day Parade. That makes a great deal for us, you know. It will lift her profile and to educate current and future generations on the role that entertainment played during World War II. And Doreen's daughter knows how it would make her mum feel to walk in the parade. She would be so proud, looking down on Sunday. Yeah. The next step for the charity is memorial at the National Arboretum, ensuring our wartime entertainers are never forgotten. Alex Isat, ITV News. Finally to rugby, and after their defeat by New Zealand last weekend, England suffered again today, losing to Australia in the final moments of what was a dramatic game at Twickenham. Chris Scudder was watching. There's nothing the Aussies like less than losing to the Poms at anything. But they'd lost 10 of the last 11 against the old enemy, and England sensed they were there for the taking. Try for Cunningham South, celebrating like Chelsea's Cole Palmer. Here goes Genge. The giant Cunningham South soon had his second try. A big hit in England's 18. But they didn't have quite so much to sing about when former rugby league star Joseph Suwali, playing his first ever pro rugby union game, set up an epic fight back. The Wallabies scored three tries to bounce into the lead. But step forward, Ollie Slate home with two crucial tries. And where England had suffered a string of narrow defeats, this time they just about reversed the trend. Or so they thought, with Australia scoring a late dramatic try to win an amazing match by five points. Chris Scudder, ITV News. And that's all for the moment. We're back at half past ten with all the latest. Until then, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.